G'day everyone. Quite some time ago, I took a look at DOSBox versus some real hardware. Today I thought we'd take a look at another emulator that could also be used for running MS-DOS programs called 86box. What makes it extremely different is that it's not so much focused on emulating MS-DOS itself, it's more focused upon emulating the machines in a cycle accurate way. It covers a range of configurations that you can choose from, from early IBM PCs all the way up to Pentium 2s from around the early 2000 era. This makes it possible to run alternative operating systems such as Windows or BOS or Unix of various different flavors in addition to just MS-DOS. For the purposes of today's video, we'll focus on emulating and running MS-DOS programs. The first step is of course setting up your virtual machine that you want to run. The configuration options are very extensive, allowing you to change even the most subtle settings such as the weight states or how much cache memory a machine has. This allows you to precisely target a particular type of machine that you want to emulate, whether it's a Pentium 2 or an 8088 XT machine. In my case, I've configured 86 box to emulate a 20 MHz 386 SX, although I have tried a number of configurations to try and sort out some problems that I had whilst using this program. One nifty feature that I quite liked was the ability to configure the peripherals as well. I quite liked being able to pick which type of monitor to connect, such as a grayscale amber or green one. Here I've captured a little bit of footage of Zargon to show the main differences between the four screens that you can connect to a VGA card. The monitor selection options don't end there, however, because if you run a CGA card, you can choose to run a composite monitor. This is extremely useful for CGA games such as Freddy's Rescue Roundup, which do not trigger DOSBox's mode for composite monitors. In the case of Freddy's Rescue Roundup, it's actually quite an improvement over the normal CGA graphics, something which I haven't been able to see up until now. You can also play CGA games that don't normally use a composite monitor, such as Alley Cat here. It doesn't really improve the graphics, but it's nice to know what it would look like. I tried out a number of games, so we'll go through them all and briefly describe how they ran. Here I loaded up VET. It, for the most part, worked quite well. The only problem was I had difficulty with the keyboard controls. Uh, this is something we'll get back to because I actually had this problem with a lot of games. VGA Leaper here is a Frogger clone that works exceptionally well. Both the controls and the sound worked fine. Woodfruit, the slot machine simulator, similarly also worked quite well, with no problems. Zargon, which I showed earlier, ran mostly fine, with the exception of having keyboard difficulties, much like VET. Basically the normal arrow keys didn't work and I had to use the numeric keypad instead. I didn't have any of these issues with where in time has come in San Diego. It worked perfectly fine.
Catacomb was also a game that worked quite well. The controls for Battle Chess worked quite well, but the sound seemed a bit off. I'm not quite sure how to put my finger on it, but if you listen, you'll notice it doesn't sound quite right. Corridor 7 doesn't perform particularly well on a 386 at 20 MHz, so it didn't play particularly well, but it didn't have any of the issues with sound or controls. This version of the demo doesn't have any sound, so that's part of the reason. Dark Ages plays and sounds quite well. Hocus Pocus on the other hand doesn't seem to do as well. I used to play it on a 386 running at 20 MHz and I don't remember it playing quite this slow. Also the PC speaker sound effects are quite off, although you could configure for Sound Blaster sound if you wanted to avoid that. Adam Peterson's jetpack played quite well. Uh, you'll notice that I've only got ad-lib sound on. That's because I put an ad-lib card in this virtual machine rather than a sound blaster one. Civilization played quite well, although it was a little awkward to play because I didn't have a mouse driver loaded. Not having a mouse loaded turned out to be even more inconvenient when trying to play colonization, but he did otherwise work well. F117A Nighthawk didn't fare so well. It had both problems with the keyboard controls and the sound. Basically, the arrow keys did not work when it came to flying the plane, which was very annoying. I also found that during the introduction sequence, both PC speaker and AdLib seemed to glitch a little bit when the screen was cleared or changed modes. It's difficult to describe, but the best way is to hear it for yourself. Silent Service didn't have any issues with its controls, but the sound in general was a bit quiet, and the digitised speech, whilst sounding very clear, was extremely quiet. King's Quest IV worked quite well, apart from the arrow keys not working to control Rosella. It was quite nostalgic to return to this one. I tried to play through the first level of Thixter 2 Firehawk, but the controls were really, really broken in this one.
I was surprised when SimCity had issues with its controls. So this is one that I actually used to try and diagnose the issue later. The arrow key controls didn't work properly in Spectre, but I found that if I had to move to the numeric keypad I could play the game properly. For Commander Keen Goodbye Galaxy, I found the controls worked fine, but there were these weird graphical glitches that I saw throughout the game. There wasn't anything that I could think of that would explain this. Duke Nukem 1 seemed to work quite well, and I didn't have any trouble with the controls. I also tested my own game, Bob's Fury with 86 box, and this is part of the reason I actually tested all those other games, because it has both an issue with the keyboard controls and the PC speaker sound. At first I thought it was an error in my own programming, but after testing all those other bits of software, I realised that there's probably an issue with 86 box that may be the cause, and that's why I did the wider testing. I used SimCity as a test program to determine what the cause was, partly for two reasons. The first one being that it had the same sort of issue with the arrow keys not working. And secondly, I know that SimCity also works on a very wide range of hardware, including the original IBM PC, all the way up to 486 class machines. I tested SimCity with a wide range of configurations, and I found the following. Of all the configurations of 286 machines, Pretty much all of them didn't work with the keyboard arrow keys, and a similar sort of result with the 386SX machines. Most of those didn't work except for a couple of them. The 386 motherboards were sort of a bit mixed, some of them worked and some of them didn't with the keyboard controls. The really odd part was that anything 486 and newer worked fine, and anything that was an 8088 and older also worked fine with the keyboard. I'm completely at a loss as to why this would be the case, why certain classes of machines wouldn't work with the keyboard controls for SimCity, as it's a game that I know pretty much works across the board on real hardware. The only other thought that I had is the emulation is actually correct, and the software that I had issues with the keyboard controls actually has these issues on real hardware because I don't own many old computers in the 286 and 386 range, I'll never be able to thoroughly test that theory. For the other issue I had with PC speaker sound, there weren't really any emulation settings that I could change that could possibly fix this, so there must be some kind of weird sampling error that causes the odd sounds. Having tested 86 box out thoroughly, I think it's now time to compare it to DOSBox, which is sort of the de facto standard when it comes to running MS-DOS programs on modern hardware. Let's start out with the good parts for 86 box. To start out with, I think that it's got better hardware emulation, particularly for CGA graphics and composite monitors. It also allows you to select different types of monitors for VGA displays, as well as EGA as well. This is a really big bonus because it lets you live in nostalgia if you happen to like monochrome screens. You also have significantly greater control over what hardware is emulated. Take the case of the FPU. On DOSBox you have absolutely no control over whether the FPU is enabled or not, whereas in 86box the FPU is an option that you can choose to turn on or not. This turned out to be a significant difference because when I was developing my game, I had an issue that was related to the floating point unit, and being able to turn it off was an important part of debugging a particular problem. Speaking of game development, 
86 box is much more accurate when it comes to hardware behavior and of course the ROM behavior as well. So it's a much better place to test your DOS programs that you're developing. There are also some very strong points in favor of DOSBox here as well. For a start, DOSBox is much more adaptable. You can change the cycle count, for instance, without having to reboot your virtual machine. And loading files into DOSBox is relatively simple. Whilst DOSBox isn't 100% accurate with its emulation, it is generally good enough to get most DOS games running without too much fuss. And the configuration changes can often be done at real time, because the biggest change is usually just the cycle count. 86 box is a much more complicated affair to set up. After you've configured the hardware in the settings for the machine, you have to boot it up and configure the CMOS. Unlike other virtual machines, this isn't done for you and you will need to know all of the settings and configure them, much like real hardware. After that, if you've configured a hard drive, you will need to install your operating system of choice. In my case, obviously, it's MS-DOS, so that's fairly simple, but you do need to go about doing the installation. Because the hard drives are all emulated, you will have to manage somehow to transfer all of your game data or other software data into the hard disk image. This is usually accomplished by another third-party program like WinImage, which makes it a little bit more difficult to get software onto your virtual DOS machine. If you want to run software that doesn't work on your current virtual machine, you either have to create a second one, or you'll need to reconfigure your current one, which can involve any part of the configuration process again. Everything from the CMOS setup down to the operating system setup, depending on what change you want to make. To put it shortly and bluntly, there's a lot more faffing about to change anything in 86 box. The hope being that you shouldn't have to do that too often if you set it up correctly the first time. To sort of try and summarize, I think the DOS box is quicker and easier to set up and also a little bit more flexible as well in that you can change some settings on the fly. It's certainly good enough for playing the vast majority of MS-DOS games but it does have some shortcomings which make 86 box a good choice as well. I think 86 box is a good choice where you're developing software for MS-DOS as it's a better testing platform. It also seems to be a better platform for playing older CGA games which are much more sensitive to CPU speed and graphic card choice. It is also more accurate when it comes to hardware and software behavior so that can be a bonus if you're trying to do something that DOSBox doesn't normally handle very well. Oh, and of course, the final bonus is that you can run any operating system that you want, such as Windows 95 or 98, or even something a bit more esoteric like Windows NT. I hope you found this look into 86 box interesting and useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.